Welcome to the workshop. Uh, tonight we're going to be looking at this pure sine wave inverter that's used as part of a solar array and it's not outputting any voltage on the AC side. So let's crack it open and see what's going on. So this thing wants 24 volts and it's going to turn it into 240 volts AC for use here in the UK. Now because this thing has come in with a fault it's probably best not to try and power it up because powering up a device with a fault can lead to it having more faults. So I'm going to pop the case off and have a look inside see if we can find anything dangerous that we wouldn't want to run power through before we invest further. This is held on with little screws and nuts which is a little bit unusual. And a couple of screws on the top here that do go into the uh, side metal piece. No nuts on these. All right first impressions inside I'm expecting to see something that resembles an automotive amplifier just with a fixed input frequency perhaps. Okay yes quite similar to a modern high power car audio amplifier. Let's have a look what we've got. Firstly this thing floating around at the top here appears to be the receiver for a remote. You can turn this on and off uh, remotely either by RF or yeah. So we have the 24 volts coming in here and that sits on the primaries of these transformers which will be switched by these power supply MOSFETs in a TO220 package. There's three banks on this side and there's another couple of banks on the other side of the heatsink as well. Now the PWM for those will be controlled by this board here which houses a SG3525 PWM controller. Very common, nice little chip that. We also have a buzzer on this board which I imagine will go off when the voltage on the inputs goes below a certain threshold. TO220 regulator possibly, can't quite see but it might be for the 3525 circuit. Then once these MOSFETs get going and switching the transformers that's going to step the voltage up from 24 to an AC or a switched version of very high voltage. You can see here we have these large rail capacitors which are 500 volt rated so we're going to get some pretty serious high voltage on the output side after of course being rectified by these guys on the heatsink here we've got one two three four rectifiers that's turning the AC output from the transformers into DC that's stored in these rail caps and because this is a pure sine wave inverter we have a very similar setup to an amplifier section on the end here let's have a look at this little daughter board we have a crystal oscillator and an EG8010 and that is our sine wave inverter so that's going to be generating it's 50 hertz or 60 hertz or anywhere up to about 100 hertz I think and it will use the crystal oscillator as its kind of reference for generating those frequencies. Once we've got our desired sine wave output that needs to be converted into pulses because we are running MOSFETs on the output side that's probably done on the back of this PCB there's a bunch of circuitry going on there that I can't quite make out but that's probably using a triangle wave uh, to compare the sine wave to and then creating pulses really for a sort of class D switching style setup. We have a couple of drivers on here, two one one zeros. These are high and low side drivers, so we're going to have needed to separate those pulses into high and low before they go into these drivers. And then out from there, we're probably driving the MOSFETs directly. So there's our eight output MOSFETs, 60N, 60FD1 by the looks of it. And we have 5.1 ohm gates with a parallel 4148 and a 4701 pull down. Other things in the middle here, got a couple of voltage regulators, a 7812 and a 7805. Five. That's going to be for our sine wave inverter and the driver supply most likely. So there's no visible signs of burned components or bad damage in that way just from having a quick look. Um, the customer did say that this thing powers up, gives us all the lights and everything, but it doesn't output anything on the plug socket over here. And a couple of things come to mind that might give that kind of behavior. Firstly is we might not be getting any switching on the power supply side. We could have a fault over here around the SG3525 PWM generation circuit so that we're not actually driving these power supply low voltage MOSFETs. If we are driving those and we are generating our high voltage rails, um, then we could have an output side fault here, either with the sine wave inverter itself 
Chris, Chris Loss later might have failed, although it's incredibly rare that barely ever happens. We could have some kind of drive circuit fault around the output side. That just means that we're not getting any switching on the high voltage side, meaning we're not generating our output 50 hertz sine wave for the mains plug. Now before we go any further, and before I touch any more things on here, I've just realized that these circuits might not have pull down resistors for the high voltage capacitors. A lot of the time in car amplifiers you do have pull down resistors, but these is 500 volts and I don't really want to take any. I just want to make sure we haven't got high voltage sitting around here anywhere in the circuit. Let's just check on the output MOSFETs themselves, nothing there. There's also a shunt resistor, just as a couple of folded bars here on the main board and that will most likely be dropping a touch of voltage across the high voltage rail itself to then determine how much current's being drawn from the rail and there's no high voltage on there so I think we're pretty safe that these high voltage caps have been self discharged. Now I'm just going to grab the multimeter on continuity mode and make sure none of the output MOSFETs themselves are shorted or showing a low resistance. Now usually when FETs like this fail, they will go short circuits across at least two if not all three of their legs. So we're just checking really that we don't have any dead shorts across any of the legs of these FETs. And it doesn't look like we do, that's good news. Another good check is to make sure you don't have any shorts across these voltage regulators, the 78205, that will tell us if there's any very badly failed components that these are delivering power to. Ah, that's not what we want to see. It would appear that we've got a dead short between input and ground of this 7805 regulator. That means that we're for sure not going to be getting 5 volts on its output, which means that the output drive circuit probably isn't up and running, hence why we have operation and lights when we plug 24 volts in, but no output. So I think a sensible thing to do would be to remove this regulator and see if the short on the board goes away. If it doesn't, then obviously we can investigate further on what this 5 volt regulator is supplying power to. To, but if it does then we might just got unlucky with a bad 5 volt reg. Now there's a couple of ways I can go about removing this. I would usually throw some hot air at a surface mount component like this. However because it's surrounded by a couple of these capacitors here it's a little bit tricky down to get to. Uh, I'm going to just flood the back pad with some solder here and that will heat up your device uniformly and then I can just touch it on the two front legs and it should come right away. So I'm going to drop a little bit of flux on the back there and on these two legs get some solder onto the back and we should see it flowing nicely once it's heated up enough with the trace as well there's a lot of thermal mass on the board and also in the component itself so you don't have to worry about damaging the component like this by holding the soldering iron on it it's got it's got a way to dissipate some of the excess heat so we just need to get the component up to around about 200 250 c in order for it to come desoldered Okay, so we've got fresh solder on the back there. Let's drop a little bit on these two legs and then we can kind of go between one, two, three and grab some tweezers or pliers, probably some tweezers for this, a little bit small there. And we're just going to go between the three solder points and eventually they'll stay melted long enough between the three of them for us to just pull it off. Here we go. Okay then, so what we want to know is this component itself shorted or is the short still on the board? Let's have a look. Let's go on the back here. Nothing there. Ah, nothing there. Uh-oh, looks like we have something that this supplies has failed and we're going to have to find out what it is. Let's just confirm that's still there on the board. Yep, the short is still there on the PCB. So let's trace back from here and see what we can find. The first thing I'm wondering, and probably should have checked first to be perfectly honest, obviously this 7805 is being supplied by this 7812. It's just converting down to 12 volts and then further converting down to five. So if I'd have had all my brain cells functioning, I probably would have checked the output of the 7812 first before removing the 05, because it appears that the output of the 7812 does have the short on it as well. So that's the next one to remove. So again, we have the same situation where the short could be the reg or something on the board. So let's check the reg. Ah, no short on the reg. So that means the short should still be on the board. This gets interesting. Yes, it is. 
Now the 7812 regulator could be supplying a whole number of different components here on the output circuit, namely the output drive circuit, and that's where I'm going to be looking at first probably. We can put our multimeter probe on the output of the 7812, and we can have a probe around a few other bits and pieces here and see what it is supplying. And if we get a beep on two of the legs of any IC or regulator or transistor, then we have a suspect. My main suspicion is this output driver card here, so let's check all all of the pins leading up to the surface mount components on here and see what kind of continuity they have to our output and ground pads from our 7812. Now if we pop my meter onto the lowest resistance setting, this is a pretty cheap rubbish meter to be honest, so we have about 0.4 ohms of test lead resistance. I just want to see whether the short on the board that we're dealing with is sub ohm, which means it will read the same as that, or whether it's a little higher. Okay, we have 0.8 on the multimeter, or 0.9. That's actually useful because that then allows me to see which pins or components have continuity to either the output from the regulator or to ground. And that should help me identify which part of the circuit is actually causing an issue here. So let's put our black probe on the 7812 output pad and let's start with probe and let's start with pin one here. We have continuity, but it's 0.9 ohms. That means that that is a ground. Next one along is a 0.9 as well, so they are both ground. Third one along, no continuity. Fourth one along, 0.9, that's a ground. In five, nothing. Six, seven, that's a, that's a 0.9 ohms, so that's a ground as well. Next one, next one, next one. Next one, that's a 0.9, so that's a ground as well. Next one, ground. Next one, that's a ground as well. Next one along also has continuity. Ah, but that one right there is a 0.4 ohm, so that is continuity to the 12 volts output. Now I've got a couple of choices here and which one I choose will affect the repair cost of this device. So the easiest thing would be just to run a little cut through this trace here that leads from the regulator output pad to this driver card. By cutting a little slit in this trace, I can isolate this card on the 12 volt supply line and see whether the short is actually on the card or on the main board. And then once we're finished with the repair, we just run a tiny solder blob over the top of it. That'll keep the repair cost down as it's nice and quick. Alternatively, I can remove this whole PCB out of this case and desolder the daughter board to have a good look at it and isolate it that way, but that will take longer. Well, given that we can access most of the components for the drive circuit on this side of the daughter PCB without removing it, I think the issues likely to be around here might even be the drivers themselves. And having a way for a future technician to isolate 12 volts going into this driver card might be a nice touch anyway. So I am just gonna run a little slit in this trace and that will not only speed up this repair, but also maybe make life easier for a future tech. Now let's see, has the short disappeared from the main board? Yes, it has. So the issue, as I suspected, is on the driver card. Now all we need to do is identify which component on here is causing the short. And clip on some wires to the power supply so we can throw some current through this. Okay, and let's go. So we've dropped from one volt to 0.8 of a volt with 0.5 amps going in. Nothing has instantaneously sprung to high temperature just yet. Let's uh, leave it a bit longer. I'm going to go up a little bit on the current. We're at 0.6 of an amp now, a bit more voltage required. I'm going to go up to 2 volts and we are currently sitting at 1 amp with 2 volts going in. I'm seeing something here starting to heat up. The hot spot's at 28 Celsius. I'm going to go up to 3 volts now. We're now rapidly climbing to 39, 40 degrees Celsius. So that is a definite hot spot. I'm going to remove the current and just because this is a pretty cheap thermal imaging camera the resolution isn't great so I'm going to see if I can just hone in on the spicy component by having a little feel around here so to be honest with the finger it could be either the capacitor or the drive IC so let's go a little bit hotter. Another trick we can do is once it gets above like 60 we can spray some isopropyl alcohol on the board and whatever it evaporates from will be the uh, shorting component there. Okay, we're up at 43 degrees Celsius now. Let's have a little feel. Ah, yes, these capacitors down here feel absolutely fine. However, one of these chips gave me a little bit of a, a little bit of a, a hot shock. Yep, 
there we go that chip right there that one feels very hot on the finger so the next step's pretty obvious we're going to go ahead and get this chip out of here and order a replacement as soon as this chip died i might as well go ahead and replace both of these it's not going to take very much more time and these chips i imagine are pretty cheap so we might as well replace both of them for the same batch or the you know the same the same manufacturing run just to keep all the tolerances and everything as close as possible to original now would be a great time for my new hot air gun nozzles to have arrived. Unfortunately, the tip broke off this one a couple of days ago. I've ordered some new bent ones, but they haven't arrived yet. So I'm going to see how it goes with this one. I am pretty accurate with it. I just don't want to overheat these capacitors around the ICs. There we go. That's the first one off. There we go. Lovely stuff. Now this was the dead ones so that's going straight in the bin. This second one I will put to one side as a spare I can use in my own project or something just as a spare to have that's probably known working. A little bit more flux on these pads and we're gonna freshen them up with some fresh solder. I suspect they probably use lead free solder in the factory when making this but uh, for repair work here in the shop I use 6040 just because it is much more resilient to changes in temperature and fatigue. You have to think there's a reason why lead-free solar isn't allowed to be used in aerospace applications where human safety is absolutely critical because it is widely accepted and known that lead-free solar just isn't as good and can cause issues especially in those kind of environments where they're subjected to high swings in temperature or vibration and that sort of thing. So the drivers in question, SLM2110, these are basically just a different manufacturer's version of the pretty standard IRS2110. Um, slight differences here is the 2110 from SLM can operate up to 600 volts, whereas from the IRS range, you need to get the 2113 if you want the 600 volt stability. Uh, the 2110 is stable to 500 volts. Now, given that this board here has 500 volt rail caps i assume we're way far enough away from 500 volts to need the 13 so a irs2110 will be absolutely adequate for this purpose and the reason looking at these is because the slm is not available to purchase over in this side of the world but the irs is a very common part you can see that the pin configuration and all of the specifications are absolutely identical between these two data sheets pretty much so we will have no problem with the irs part Right, well, I've received my new drive ICs for this inverter, so let's crack these open. Had to order five, but it's always good to have some spares. So like I say, we're replacing both of these at the same time. Might as well, since we're here. These are going to be the same batch as well, which is going to be best for this circuit. So let's load up these pads with some fresh flux and then drop the chips on and get our soldering on. So there could be plenty else wrong with this as well, which caused these drivers to fail in the first place. So I think for the first power up after I've replaced these, I'm just going to inject the required low voltage auxiliary supplies just to make sure nothing overheats and see if we get some switching and some audio output, some 50 hertz from this inverter IC and then go from there. Not bad at all, I'd say, from that strange angle. So I found a ground point, which is actually these jumper bars here, which is interesting. I thought they'd be rail, but they seem to be connected to ground. And I have this crocodile clip connected to the 7812 input. Now, what I'm going to do is turn the power supply to a very low voltage. Ignore the 17 volts. That's just an over voltage preset. We've got, we got 0.5 of an amp here that I'm going to allow in. And I'm going to gradually increase the voltage monitor the current draw, make sure everything's okay. And I think a good telltale sign would be if I monitor the output of the five volt reg here and just watch that rise up. So let's have a look and watch the oscilloscope. See, got a volt here to start with, two volts, three volts, four volts, five volts. Okay, we're getting a little movement on the scope screen here. It's jumping up now, as you can see, six, 
seven, eight, nine. So we're locked at five volts on the five volt rig, which is great. We are now up at 12 volts and we don't have much current draw still sitting at around 0.1, which is where this power supply likes to, for some reason, sit at. And we also have a red LED on the board, which is what we like to see. Okay, I'm gonna power that off now for a second. Now what I would very much like to do is probe some of the pins on the 2110s here to see whether we have PWM coming from the generation circuit and see if it has any output. I don't know, it might need it might need the rest of the uh, supply up and running in order to activate, but I just want to see what's going on. So as you can see here, we've got low in and high in on pins 12 and 14, and our outputs are on 1 and 8. So let's have a look at the outputs first. Start off with pin 8, that's nice and easy over there. Okay, we have some PWM. That actually looks beautiful. And the reason I say that is because it does look like we have PWM based on 50 hertz. You can see here, if I zoom right out, the gaps in between these kind of dense parts of the waveform, that is actually about a 50 hertz cycle right there. So that's looking very promising. So we have 50 hertz coming into the drivers as PWM. So let's check that on both outputs for high and low. So let's pin one now. Looks good. Pin eight of the other chip. Ah, that's a little different. That's a little different. We have a very strong PWM for that one. Now that might be intentional, I'm not sure. The problem is I've never seen one of these working so I don't know what the intended operation is supposed to be. Let's have a look at the inputs now for a second. Okay, so that's the input to the chip that has the strong wave. That, that literally just has a 50 hertz square wave on it, doesn't it? Okay, no worries. Well, it's clear that the drive circuit is up and running with very little effort. All we did was inject 12 volts. That means that these drivers will be trying to drive the output MOSFETs, which usually would have about 300, 350 volts on them. However, we don't want that yet because we don't know if this is actually fully functional or not. So what we're going to do is inject that same 12 volts that we gave to the drive circuit onto the single positive rail that would normally have 350 volts on it, we're gonna give it 12 volts. And I want to see what the output section starts doing. If it does generate 50 hertz, it'll probably be very clipped because it's expecting to output the 50 hertz uh, with enough rail for, you know, for, for 240 volts AC, so we're probably gonna get a square wave output uh, because we're only injecting 12 volts worth of DC. But I just want to see how the output MOSFETs are operating at this time. Okay, I have our 12 volts here connected to the high side drain, which is where the high voltage is going to be. Um, this is in full boost topology, I have de determined. So I'm going to start off right down low again with the voltage low and just gradually increase it. I've got the 12 volts into the regulator on a foot pedal, so I can just activate and deactivate that at my heart's content. So we're going to go up to 12 volts, give us a 12 volt rail, and just confirm that we have 12 volts there on the high side drain. Yes we do. So I'll go along to one of the low sides and hit the foot pedal which is going to send the 12 volts to the drive circuit and see what the bloody hell happens. I imagine I'll probably have to give it a bit more current so we're going to go up to about 5 amps. What's it going to do? Okay, well it's drawing barely any current which is quite a surprise. Wasn't expecting that. I thought we'd get an excessive current draw, seeing as this is pretty beefy stuff, and we've got low voltage, which might upset the inductor circuit or the filter network or something. But as you can see here on this side, we do have our kind of PWM version of 50 hertz. And if we go along to the other side, you can see there we have our hard version. Okay. So what do we actually have? on the output at the mains plug socket though. We won't obviously have 230 volts, but we're gonna have something. I just wanna see what it looks like. Okay, so we have that which is on what looks like the neutral and that which is what's on the live by the looks of it. So we have a couple of different things there and I have seen this type of behavior from inverters before. So what I'm gonna do is actually set up two probes and go differential with some channel math to see what the resulting waveform across those two outputs looks like. That one on there, 
So I've got two probes here hooked up across the outputs, basically each half of the bridge or each channel if you like, and this is what it currently looks like on the scope screen. You can see one of the channels looks like a perfect square wave, the other one has this interesting kind of broken sine wave on it. However, watch what happens when we turn both of these channels off and do some channel math to see what the load will actually see across these terminals. It is in fact a perfect sine wave, which I'm quite surprised about because we don't have the full rail voltage present yet. We only have 12 volts worth of input. However, this device must be clever enough to look at the rail voltage level and adjust the gain of this 50 hertz sine wave into the drivers to compensate for how much voltage is actually present on the rail which is pretty clever. I would have imagined you'd need to set a fixed gain level to compensate for how much output voltage you're going to have, but it looks like this circuit might actually just, you know, detect, read the voltage on the rails and adjust the sine wave to compensate. If we, if we remove the rail voltage actually, but keeping the 12 volt circuit active, what happens to the sine wave? It, it disappears, disappears beautifully. We get absolutely no clipping of the sine wave whatsoever. If I touch this back onto the positive rail, we should see that immediately come back. Little spark, and yes, we get our sine wave beautifully back on board. I can also increase the power supply above 12 volts to go up to 16 volts. You can see the sine wave there increases with the supply. So I would say that this device is ready to rock and roll. I would say we have found the issue, fixed it, all it was was a shortage drive IC. So the slightly scary part now comes of connecting this thing up to 24 volts and seeing whether we actually have mains voltage output at the terminals. So moment of truth then, does it work or does it explode? I actually had to order a new power supply. I bought this from eBay. It's an old Farnell 30 volt 10 amp supply because I I mainly work on car amplifiers and only need up to 16 volts, which this 40 amp 16 volt supply does. However, this thing takes 24 volts, so I needed something that went up above 24. So let's power the mains supply on. Got 24 volts sitting there. I'm going to go all the way up to maximum on the current here. Eee, apparently. Uh, let's just go back a little bit there. And because this is open on the bench here, we've got like probably 350 volts. Going to do some eye protection and have the scope hooked up to one of the outputs here, so we'll either get the square wave or the funky waveform shape, not sure which. So let's turn the output power on from the supply. Charging caps there, and moment of truth, let's turn this thing on and see what the bloody hell happens. Okay, it's telling us that there's not enough current on tap for it to power up. I thought maybe pulsing this a few times would charge some of the high voltage rails, which I suspect is probably happening. We might just need to do this a few times. Yeah, you can see the pulses on the scope are getting bigger each time. So we are actually charging the caps very gradually here. Okay, that didn't sound very nice. What was that? What happened there? That looks pretty bad and sounds horrendous as well. <sighs> I wonder why it does that. Anything getting hot? Don't really know. Let's unplug this for a second. Oh, fucking hell. Well, that's not what you want to happen. That is a bit of a disaster. I probably shouldn't have kept turning it on and off, but I was wondering whether the fact that I had something here plugged in, it wasn't liking that, so I thought I'd try it one more time with the thing unplugged. Uh, but sadly, um, there's a lot more damage this time. Um, we've lost some of the IGBTs on the output side, which is extremely frustrating to go from thinking you have something fixed to having made it much worse. So this is now going to be a lot more expensive. We need to buy new IGBTs. It's probably killed the drivers again. So we're probably going to need more drivers. And more importantly, we need to work out 
why was this happy on a low rail voltage creating a beautiful sine wave but then as soon as it had the full rail present it uh, yeah it wasn't had this strange issue and I, unfortunately I wasn't probing both of the outputs I was only probing one of them so I don't know if there was some glitch or the other one was failing to build and sadly as well although I was filming the the flash and the spark was too fast for my camera to actually pick it up it didn't catch the area that the little explosion came from. I feel like it came from over this area and actually we do see this capacitor here looks like it's not particularly well soldered um, to the top trace on the board then. I'm wondering if that might have something to do with it. But there was a fair bit of a spark and that's definitely had to have come from somewhere and it should have left some residue or some kind of hint as to where it came from. So what I'm going to have to do is cut out the dead IGBTs. I'm probably going to just remove all of them and replace all of them. And then we're going to have to inject our low voltage um, back into the board to get the drive circuit back up and running again. And then turn our attention to this output filter network I imagined. Find out what's going on there, why I didn't like it. I might see if I can generate some uh, high voltage rails myself and gradually work my way up. And I think given the nature of that failure, it would be wise to just strip the board completely from the heatsink here. That way we can get a good look at the underside of the PCB, just in case there's anything funky going on there. And the failure that we just saw might have been the original cause, actually, which killed the driver originally. Just that we got a bit more unlucky this time round, and instead of just killing the driver, it killed the IGBTs. Possibly either the, the driver just now failed first and killed the IGBTs with it, um, or something fed back from the filter network here to the drivers through the IGBTs but this time they just didn't survive so very very frustrating there's a bunch of screws on the bottom here that are holding the uh, heat sink blocks to the case and you need to come up right let's get a look under here ah well hello what is that we have some big evidence of an explosion down here on the heatsink and that corresponds to this IGBT solder joint. Now I don't think that anything was shorting there to the heatsink. That should be high enough off. Yeah that's definitely more than high enough away so I highly doubt that anything was shorting to the case here. I wonder whether just with the failure that happened, um, the energy has caused that just from the IGBTs failing. You know what, it actually looks like these have been replaced in the past. It, these do not look like factory solder joints and we actually have a little bit of burnt PCB here that looks like it hasn't burnt recently, that looks like that has kind of burnt before in the past and then this has been repaired. There's not a lot of solder on this connection point here, hmm. Yeah, I'm wondering actually whether something funky was going on with the repair. There's also some kind of solder that's like splashed over here, looks like maybe from a, a repair in the past. That bit of solder as well just come off there. So yeah, I'm wondering whether this had a, had a service in the past with these IGBTs being replaced. Now let's take a look at this capacitor over here that's uh, a bit funky. So the solder on the bottom does look okay. Uh, well, I say okay, it's not great, but it's it's is connected at least. And we've got vias to the top of the board, so although it doesn't really look like it's soldered up here, it, it will be making a connection from the bottom to the top of the board, so I don't think that's an issue there. All right, let's get these IGBTs out and uh, see what we're cooking with. Let's uh, preheat the board a little bit. Let's uh, preheat the board a little bit, just get some heat into the board. Makes it a bit easier to desolder these larger package components. And for getting these off, I love to use this old Weller from the early 90s. It's a 200 watt iron with a pretty large tip. I always say you can never really go too overkill on your soldering iron when doing large package stuff like this. Just having this much thermal mass is so useful rather than having a pinny little 60 watt iron that as soon as you touch it on a big wide trace like this all the heat just gets sucked out of it. So you just heat all three legs and then it just comes straight out very quick and easy. Now actually I don't think I've got myself completely to blame for this failure. 
I've just been having a look at these IGBTs and noticed something interesting. These parts are in fact not genuine. Once I realised that this had been repaired before, I looked a little bit closer at the IGBTs in the output stage and you can notice how the texture of the front of the case here looks like it is striped. It has a kind of sideways stripe pattern to it that is a completely different finish to the rest of the casing here and that is an absolute telltale sign that this has been scraped or sanded off and then re-laser marked on with this new marking. So this could still be an IGBT but it could be a completely different model with lower voltage rating or different gate capacitance, current handling, etc. And it might not work well in this circuit. So these blowing like they just did probably did me me and the customer a favor in the long run because we're going to be able to fit this with some genuine replacement parts. Now I'm not sure if this inverter ever actually did work with these IGBTs fitted. What may have happened is this was looked at by a previous technician and new IGBTs were fitted and there was an issue with the drive circuit which is what we found out and repaired last time but the previous technician who was clearly a little bit inexperienced buying parts off of eBay or AliExpress or Amazon which is where you get these kind of things from may not have been able to diagnose and repair the issue with the drive circuit that we found so these may have never actually been run in the circuit at all um, and the reason they blew up may have just been because they were above their voltage threshold. They might even be MOSFETs. They might even be 200 volt MOSFETs. Who knows what they were? I imagine, however, that this inverter was in fact fitted with genuine 60N60 FD1s, which is why the previous technician has ordered these, tried to find them, you know, stock original replacements online and managed to get these fakes. I can't imagine anyone ordering non-genuine parts but there were a different make or model of component because anyone ordering something that's non-original would usually have the knowledge to compare data sheets and we'd be buying from a reputable source. Generally, if you find fake replacements fitted in a device like this, it's where someone less experienced has tried to find the exact original part numbers that were fitted from factory, which in this case may be just only available in um, the Eastern world rather than available in Europe or in the Americas. So. The ones that they end up fitting are rebadged fakes. In any case, we have removed those IGBTs. Now, what we need to do is see whether the drive circuit has gotten hit by that failure again. We might need to replace the drivers and possibly some other stuff. So let's flip this back round and have a probe with the multimeter and see what we're dealing with here. Let's have a read across the voltage regulators where we did see some short circuits before with the bad drivers. Let's have a look. So let's go across to 7812 first. Ah yes, we have 19 ohms between the output and ground, which is probably gonna tell us that the drivers are toast again. I'll remove those just now and see if the short goes away because who knows, maybe the spike has made its way back further this time than the drivers to some of the other circuitry. That short across the 12 volt reg should have disappeared now. Yep, there we go. These drive ICs actually came as a pack of five, so I do have two spares already here in stock. Let's drop those in. I'm just going to check all of the 5.1 ohm gate resistors that lead from the drive circuit up to the IGBTs because clearly, since we have dead drivers, some spike has made its way through these gate resistors, so I just want to go ahead and make sure that these are all okay. You're seeing 9 on the multimeter there, that's just because we're in diode continuity mode, so it's not dead accurate down at low resistances, but I know that that's absolutely fine. Yep, looking okay there. Now what I'm going to do is just reconnect our low voltage test supply, put the ground on there, and 12 volts on the input to the 7812. Now obviously this time I don't have any IGBTs fitted, so to test the drive circuit we're going to go and probe the gate of each of these banks and just see what we get on the scope. Okay, power up now, let's have a look. We get some DC on this one right here. A little bit of DC. Starts off at about 5 volts and gradually sinks down by the looks of it. Okay, how about on this gate? Aha, here we go. 
So this is going to be our low side gate and we are getting the PWM that we saw before when we had the IGBTs fitted, that's looking good. Varying duty cycle creating that kind of strange jagged uh, 50 hertz sine wave that then references the high side. So we've got high side, high side, low side, low side, high side with a fight with the seven volts on it on that one. Interesting. The high sides have different amounts of DC on them. So high side gate 4.5, 4.5, PWM, PWM. Seven volts, seven volts, nothing and nothing. Okay, so looks like we don't have any PWM on these two low sides on this bank. Now, I wonder why that is. It could be that this bank needs the other bank oscillating in order to kind of generate the input PWM that this then sends to the low side gate. So I'm not going to immediately assume that there is a problem here. I suspect that this bank may take reference from the output of this bank for generating the PWM to the gate here. So I'm going to go ahead and fit some new IGBTs and remaining on the low voltage here coming from the 12 volts um, that will give us plenty of time and low voltage to potentially still have a fault but not cause any further damage and investigate further. So the IGBTs that this inverter likely originally used from Fractory were the SGT60N60FD parts. Now these are a field stop IGBT with a 600 volt voltage breakdown rating and 60 amps of constant current draw. We have a pulse collector current of 180 amps. Input capacitance, which is quite important for the drive circuit, is 2850 typically. The turn on delay is 36 nanoseconds, while the rise, turn off and fall time are all somewhere between 150 and 200 nanoseconds. The replacements that I opted for are these AIGW 40N65F5s. These are trench stop IGBTs. And they have a marginally higher breakdown voltage of 650 volts, slightly higher constant current as well at 74 amps, but that's not really relevant here. The um, pulse collector current is on 120 amps and most importantly I matched up the input capacitance at 2500 picofarads typical thought that was about the same and the characteristics the delay timings we have a turn on delay time of 19 nanoseconds which is about twice as fast as the original ones the rise time is wildly faster with only 11 nanoseconds compared to the original 142 nanoseconds now I don't know what effect that will have but generally quicker is better the turn off delay at 165 nanoseconds is again a little faster but not by that much of the 193 of the original RGBTs and the full time of 13 nanoseconds again is wildly faster um, we've got 136 nanoseconds of the original RGBTs so it's generally a much much faster part which typically means better results um, and less cross conduction it's just easier and nicer all around my replacement IGBTs arrived and I fitted them, only to discover that we did in fact still have some drive circuit faults. I wasn't getting drive correctly, the waveforms looked all out of whack um, and something was definitely up. So I investigated further and I identified that when the original IGBTs exploded and spiked back killing the drive IC, the spike went further this time and took out the 8010 chip which is what generates the PWM for the output side to oscillate around. I can't remember, I think we were missing one or two sets of PWM from the output of the 8010. So I had to see if I could order a new chip. So I have ordered a replacement inverter IC uh, but you can't seem to buy them on their own just as a chip. The only way I could find to purchase one was to buy one of these pre-assembled uh, SPWM drive cards here that has the chip that I need on it. And what I'm going to do is, now these, these boards seem to be relatively universal, um, even the one in here is very very similar and likely shares the same like pinout at the bottom, um, but there is slight different layouts. Um, so what I don't want to do is to replace the full board just in case this one has some differences that mean it's incompatible with this main board, but I'm going to desolder this chip here and desolder this one and swap that one onto the original board that came with this inverter, so let's get to doing that.
Let's get this new one off. Did also get some spare 2113s with this board and a bunch of other parts. 12 megahertz oscillator. There we go. Loads of flux on there which is good. Just get the position roughly correct. It should pull itself into the right place once the solder's all melted but I just want to make sure that it's on the correct pins. There we go, it's just pulled itself into the set. So, Well time to see if that's worked then. So I'm going to start off by just probing the IGBTs here and I'm going to give it 12 volts into the control drive circuit as we have done previously to start with and I want to see whether we get drive on both sides now so let's probe the low side drain here I think this is low side drain yep low side drain this side see what we got on the scope okay we have a perfect square wave there oscillating at 50 Hertz okay I can't remember what we had before. It's been a couple of weeks now actually since I did this. So a square wave there, square wave there, on that side, and then here. Ah. We now have nothing on this side. That's really strange. I'm pretty sure it was one of these that didn't have anything on it before. Alright, let's check the inputs to these. Yeah, we've got inputs on this driver, but we don't seem to have any inputs on this driver at all. Nothing there, nothing there, 5 volts there. So that's annoying. There seems to be the other driver now that doesn't have any inputs. I was just checking the outputs from the 8010 and it seems that we do actually have four outputs so this does appear to be working fine see we've got one here working fine go along number two output that's working fine as well number three output that's working fine and number four output that's working absolutely fine as well now that's really strange it seems that we don't have output from the two one one zeros so nothing on this input let's go to high input and nothing there either so this one's not getting any drive so let's trace back with the multimeter and figure out why I actually buffered on the back here there's a couple of little transistors SOT23 you can just about make out there I decided to just remove the board here entirely and do a much closer inspection and see what's going on because it is tricky doing it with in the in the main board there. I didn't really expect there to be as many problems as there are but now that there are let's get it out of the board and investigate. So each of these transistors has a resistor here 5100 so let's just check all of these. Can't get the multimeter cam working but we do have 5.08 4.98 4.9 Yeah, these are all okay. I think I found the issue and you're not going to believe it. So, each of these four transistors is supposed to connect to the 8010 through these four traces here for each of the four drive signals, okay? So, each of these has continuity to one of these vias. This one up here, this one here, and then this one here, and this one here. Okay, so obviously these vias then connect through to these four output pins of the 8010. However, I can probe any four of the transistors on the back here and get continuity through to the 8010 apart from P1. Let's probe P1. Absolutely, absolutely nothing. So I'm probing P1, which has continuity to the via, which is this one. Continuity to the via, however, no continuity to the other side. So that means that 
the little via here is bad and not actually making a connection from this side of the board to this side of the board. So I'm just seeing if doing a quick reflow of the vias um, helps. It might just be a tiny little hairline break in one of them. So I have scratched off the top of each of the vias, dropped in some flux, and I am now running fresh solder through the hole. And I'll do the same on the other side as well. Right, let's see if we get continuity now. There we go. Now I have continuity between that transistor and the outputs from the 8010. Let's just check we still have the other ones as well. Yeah, okay, cool. Now I was considering using this other board, the brand new one, but see I noticed how this one's got some pretty chunky capacitors on here. Um, I would imagine it definitely looks and feels like this one is the higher quality board, um, so I would rather use this one if I can. Okay, so technically we should now get drive on all of these IGBTs. So, IGBT number one, yep, looks good. That's uh, bank number two, looks good. Bank number three, Three looks good and bank number four ah that's what we like to see okay wow now let's inject the uh, 12 volts into here because it didn't have 12 volts on the rails there and just see whether we get the correct sine wave like we saw the first time round before the fake IGBTs popped their top so 12 volts going in so if I power up now that is a high side so if I probe the low side drain we should get something familiar Hmm, okay, well, it's a little different there on the scope. That certainly looks a little different to what we had first time around. It's uh, got a big spike there on the way down. Hmm, yeah, a couple of big spiky boys. But what I'm going to do is take my two oscilloscope probes and connect them across the outputs. See what the sine wave looks like. Okay, we're across the terminals, so that's what both channels look like. So if we turn these off and do the channel math. Okay, well, we have a sine wave, however, doesn't look anywhere near as good as it did first time around when we had the fakes fitted. You can see there's this horrendous thing here. Um, I suspect that's some crossover distortion of some kind. You can see here, massive spike there as well. Oh dear, it's possible that these IGBTs need some tweaks to the drive circuit perhaps. That's very very annoying because I don't really know whether that's caused by the IGBTs. Well it's got to be, we've got the original chip fitted and um, original drivers so it's just got to be a characteristic of the replacement IGBTs I reckon. So the circuit's clearly working and we have the correct drives on each bank of IGBTs, high side and low side for both channels. However, I think that just the characteristics of these replacement IGBTs, they're a bit too fast perhaps and the drive circuit was kind of calibrated around the original IGBTs being a bit slower and therefore the kind of crossover between the uh, one side turning on and the other side turning off was a bit slower therefore it's smoother and the sine wave merged together better whereas this looks very sharp and spiky and I think these are too fast. It's very very difficult with a circuit like this that's relying on the exact characteristics of a specific model of IGBT that you can no longer buy um, to find something that works in its place. Um, so I've got a couple of options I think from here on out. Provided that this problem is related to the IGBT's characteristics, I can try and remove them and try some other parts. Just keep ordering parts until, you know, with, with maybe slower timings, until I find some that 
work and where the sine wave looks good. Um, alternatively, I can try and make some modifications to the drive circuit itself to make it be happy with these much faster IGBTs. Um, I could, there's probably going to be some changes on the driver card uh, like that. So I've had this on the back burner for a while, and since then I've actually purchased two other types of IGBT, Father Project's big amplifiers, and I have some spares from the batches that I bought, enough to fulfill this inverter. And I thought, okay, well let's try some different models of IGBT, just to see whether the sine wave looks any better, to see whether that's our problem here. So I removed all of the new IGBTs that I had fitted, and I've just quickly tacked in one per bank of this different type of IGBT. Now this is a 40V60F and this is the data sheet. So 600 volt, 40 amp, it's sort of the trench stop, very high speed switching IGBT. However, since making the rest of these clips for this video, I learned that not all IGBTs are made equal. Notably, these ones I've just fitted to the uh, inverter don't have a diode from collector to emitter. Um, and actually, neither do the IGBTs that I had fitted to the inverter that I bought brand new for it. So this is what happens when you don't take electronic school, you're just learning everything as you go. Um, so basically, a, the diode here between collector and emitter um, prevents huge voltage spikes from occurring during switching operation of these RGBTs. Um, I actually learned that the hard way by fitting some of uh, these ones here to a uh, class D amplifier and even with 12 volts of rail voltage the voltage spike from collector to emitter was high enough that it blew all the drive circuit and I had to replace that again so I learned the hard way on that one uh, and as a result that's why you can see here just for a quick test some diodes between collector and emitter uh, which simulates what would otherwise be inside the IGBT itself. Now some IGBTs have that diode internally already for example this one right here these are another model of IGBT that I have been using recently for some amplifier work and these are the D50X07 and these are 650 volt 50 amp IGBTs so either of these options will work in this inverter however what I need to find out is which ones are better suited to that create a nicer shaped sine wave um, but it did get me thinking I wonder whether the reason that the sine wave shape looks so bad with the original IGBTs that I fitted previously was just because they didn't have that internal diode and that may have been causing some strange behavior. Um, fortunately, at the lower rail voltage here, it didn't cause any damage, and I'm glad to high heaven that I didn't power it up on the full rail and just see how it went, because that would have definitely ended badly. But with these ones fitted, these little uh, 40V60s, um, with the diodes across the emitter and collector, let's just have a look and see what the sine wave shape looks like on the scope. So, we've got 12 volts there on the rail and on the VCC supply. Let's power it up and have a look. So that's looking way better. Um, just quickly, here's a comparison to what it was looking like before with the, uh, the first RGBTs I had fitted. And as you can see, much, much better. We still have this little spike here where the crossover happens, but I think that's probably always going to be there. Um, I can't remember if that was... I can't remember how prominent that was with the original IGBTs fitted that this came with, but honestly I don't think that's much of a problem. There's much less noise going on on the top of the sine wave here compared to the uh, IGBTs I fitted initially, and the shape looks a lot better at the top and bottom there. So. I'd be pretty happy with those, so what I'm going to do now is just fit these other ones, the ones that have the diode internally, DG50X07s, and just compare to see what the sine wave looks like with those as well, and then I'll decide on which ones I want to run. So let's just tack some of these other ones in place, one per bank as well. Okay, they're all in place, let's connect the 12 volt rail back up. And let's see what this looks like on the scope and just see if the idle current is uh, the same or less. Start off at 12 volts. Okay, well again that looks a lot better than with the original IGBT that I had fitted. It looks more like a sine wave. Um, we still have... Ah! Now that's better. There's still a tiny little bit of crossover noise there but it's actually way less than with those other ones. And, yep, yeah, nice shape on the top. Let's go up to 16 volts. 
now it's looking a lot more promising. That's the best I've seen so far. Yeah, these ones, I think these are the ones I'm going to go with, the ones with the diodes um, internally. This, this is the best looking sine wave out of the, the lots that I've seen so far. Um, however, I am kind of curious to see what these IGBTs look like with the diodes across them like they should have um, just to see whether that was what was causing the really bad sine wave shape or whether these are just kind of too slow or too fast or something um, not you know ideal for this circuit um, maybe I'll be able to use these in a class D amplifier of some kind with some drive, drive circuit modifications but I can keep them spare for some other project in the future if if not so yeah just gonna drop these initial replacement IGBTs back in just to see whether having a diode across them changes how they behave because uh, if they look absolutely sweet as a nut with the diode across them like they should have then I'm just going to use these ones because the specs I you know I match the specs of these ones based on the original IGBTs that were in this whereas the other IGBTs I've got were like for other amplifier projects they weren't sort of like optimized for what this circuit wants although they're still probably going to be fine um, but also I have the perfect number of these so there's not going to be any wasted or left spare whereas with the others I have like more than what's required for this circuit so I'll have a bunch spare like maybe like two or three that won't really be able to do much with so that's four of the initial replacement IGBTs that looked bad before but now they have diodes so let's turn the power supply on and see whether the diodes make any difference to the shape okay actually they do that is looking a lot better, isn't it? It seems like they might make a fair difference. The, the little spike here at the crossover point is a bit bigger than with the uh, last ones that looked really nice, the DG50X. But that is looking so much better than it was, especially at the top here. Now in addition to the diode being fitted, the other difference is that I've only got four fitted rather than eight. Um, so I should, if I'm going to use these or any really, I should try test fitting eight in place um, just to make sure that it's not something to do with like gate capacitance um, that's causing the weird shape with you know more of them fitted. So what I'm going to do I think is these ones, I've got the exact correct number of them for this inverter. So let's tack in all eight and just make sure that the um, wave shape looks the same as it did just then with the four, but instead with the eight. Okay, it does in fact stay the same. That looks way better than what it was without the diodes. So I think I'm going to roll with that and see how it goes on a full rail test. A bit scary, but it's got to be done. I just uh, soldered all these back in the board. I didn't need to remove them. I just needed to put diodes across them. Bit of a waste of time, but it's all learning curve, isn't it? At least I now know that if these go bang or aren't happy at the higher rail for whatever reason, that these DG50X whatever ones are I'm really, really happy in this circuit. So all of those IGBTs are back and I have soldered diodes as close to the IGBTs as possible across their collector and emitter. Um, let's just check that that still looks good on the scope. You know what? That actually looks better now that they're all fitted with the diodes right on the IGBT's legs rather than like hanging far off the board. Look, there used to be, there was more of a crossover distortion there, but now it's very, very nice. Almost as good as those um, DG50X IGBTs that I tried second. So I'm very happy with that. And there are a couple of potentiometers, uh, trimmer pots on the board here. And um, obviously there's no documentation as to what they do, but I have taken a reference of their resistance before I touch them. And I just want to kind of give them a little tweak around while we have that waveform on the scope there, just to see whether it changes the shape at all just to see whether it, these are like a kind of crossover distortion um calibrator or something like that so i'm just gonna twiddle around that's not doing anything at all and how about this one here mm, 
no, nah, it's not doing anything either. I just wanted to kind of see whether they do anything. I suspect they're maybe to do with the thermal cutoff or something, but um, just thought I'd give that a go. Um, so I'm pretty happy with that. That seems to be looking okay. Now I've got a couple of ideas as to how to power this up. So previously when we powered it up last time when it went bang, um, I just connected everything back to how it was supposed to be and powered it up slowly on the 24 volt supply. Right, there we go. There's some blue tack in my ears <laughs> because um, if this goes bang, it's going to be nice and loud. Eye protection always required with high voltage stuff like this. So. What we've got is we've got our 12 volts supply connected to the output of the 12 volt regulator and the reason for that is I don't know what voltage the input of the 12 volt regulator goes up to, it might exceed the limits of my bench power supply which is 16 volts which I don't want to happen so I've shifted that over to the output side and I've locked it in exactly 12 volts. So basically I can hit my foot pedal and that will turn on the oscillation circuit in here with a little red light as you can see and then I've got my 24 volt supply hooked up on a current limiter so that when I turn on the switch here it slowly starts to build the rails as you can see and the sine wave is constantly on at all times so this is the part that's scary we're going to have to go all the way up to 300 volts um, on the scope here let's just give us a quick pulse each square divide is um, 50 volts so that is 100 volts rail we need to go three times that amount before this is uh, gonna come on and stay on and I'm very scared but this is what we've got to do. I've also got the rail voltage readout up here on the screen because on the oscilloscope the waves and the voltage is gonna, are going to go off the end of the screen because they're too high for my current probes. Whew, scary stuff, let's just see what happens. I, I, really, I really wish I wasn't doing this, not gonna lie. Okay, well there's 200 volts and uh, yeah, the sine wave starts to disappear off the screen there because it's um, it's too high for the uh, the probes there. So that was 200 volts. Oh, I've got to go another 100 again. This is so terrifying, guys. I absolutely hate it. I don't like it. Okay, there we go, it's fully on and staying on. Woohoo! Okay, that was a lot of voltage as you can see on the, on the multimeter. Um, I'm just keeping the uh, 12 volt supply side active now, um, just to allow the rails to sink back down slowly. Woo! Okay, I think we have a successful repair. <laughs> oh, so, that looks good. Um, sine wave was looking good, the current draw was really nice and low wasn't it? Um, actually you couldn't even see that because you don't have a, a, a camera for the uh, 24 volt supply current but, um, but yeah the current, the idle current was nice and low on the um, 24 volt supply it was like 1.75 amps which is really nice um, so I'm going to deem that a successful repair we're going to put the um, top back on it now and um, yeah just uh, get that back to the customer and uh, Hopefully it uh, lasts for a decent amount of time for him and doesn't give him any more grief. I think these uh, IGBTs are going to be fine, everything looks stable, nice low idle current draw. I would say that's a successful repair. Guys, this has been an absolute mission, <laughs> but it's been a good learning curve. We learned a few bits and pieces. I feel a bit more confident working on inverters now as a result. Um, and I hope that you learned something from this as well, because that is one of the reasons I make these videos, entertainment and also education. It's good to learn from doing. I learned from doing. I didn't take any classes or anything. All the stuff that I've learned is just from from doing this and trying to fix stuff, failing sometimes and then eventually succeeding. So if you did enjoy it and it, you did get something out of it, then um, feel free to like and subscribe. It does, it does help the channel out a bit. Um, and uh, I will see you in the next one. Peace.